CD4. The gun, a 38 Special Smith & Weston, sat at the back of my bedside drawer. Next to it lay a box of shells. Made of blue steel with a hard black grip handle, the gun had been loaned to me by a friend after a stalker, Rosemarie Torres, had begun to show up at my Los Angeles house, screaming, ranting and raving in October 1992. But now, nine months later, I lay in my bed, sweating, terrified and hearing the gun call to me. Go on, load me, squeeze the trigger and it'll all be over. But I couldn't. Instead, I left the house when the call of the gun became too loud, too insistent. I'd drive anywhere, to a coffee shop or to a parking lot by the ocean. Once there I'd just sit and cry for I didn't know how long. After the devastating news from MCA, I went into hospital in Los Angeles so that I could have another knee operation, during which a piece of cartilage was removed. While recovering, I brooded on my musical career and what to do next. I then discovered that Karen and actor Michael Prade were planning marriage. Not long after, I suffered a different kind of a shock that had nothing to do with Karen when my accountant told me that my English bank account was missing several thousand pounds. Things were going to hell around me. And then Ruth Marie Torres came knocking. The first time that Ruth Marie Torres had turned up at my house, she'd asked if I liked the flowers that she'd sent. There had been a lot of them in the past week or so, sometimes two or three deliveries a day. Didn't I remember her, she'd asked. I told her I'd never seen her before in my life, which was true. And then she told me that she was a virgin and was waiting for me, waiting to become my wife. She stood there, her big brown eyes staring out of her gaunt face. She was 24 and painfully thin. That first time I felt spooked by her, but asked her calmly to go away and close the door. After that, things were never civil between us. She'd turn up at all times of the day and night, stand on the front lawn and scream at me when I refused to answer. She left cakes that she'd made for me on the doorstep, unless I was out, and then she'd crawl through the dog flap. One day she got in and left a cake on the table with a note which read, Get the whores out of the house. I went to the police and they suggested that I keep a log of things that she did and get back to them if ever she did anything dangerous. Apparently, breaking in was not considered dangerous enough. Torres came over more than 40 times in a three-day period in late November 1992. After she smashed a glass bird feeder, which could have cut the dogs badly had they run over it, and wrote fuck off in chocolate sauce on my neighbour's car, I decided to act. I was advised by a lawyer that I needed evidence of her harassment. And so, one late afternoon when she appeared in front of my house, I asked my old friend Danny Kleiman to videotape her. Seeing the camera, she talked directly into the lens, telling it her sad life story, of her poor upbringing and the murder of her best friend from high school. She took off different items of clothing until she was down to a mini skirt and bra. She seemed happy that I'd filmed her and left, waving and smiling. Armed with the tape, I finally managed to get the authorities to act. Yet, despite knowing that Torres had been imprisoned and banned from coming within 10 miles of me, and that California had changed their anti-stalking laws because of my experience with her, I could never feel completely happy in my house again. Which is why I kept the gun in the drawer by my bed, and why on those hot summer mornings of 1993, as I lay in bed scared of everything and nothing, the newly installed security shutters seemed to be closing in on me, preventing me from doing anything except shake with fear. Knowing that work could always lift me out of depression, I set about writing songs and planning to record with Marco. Two weeks before Christmas, 1992, I was asked to play an acoustic set at the Universal Amphitheatre in LA. Marco flew over and rehearsed with me for a couple of days, and we played on the second night. Although nervous at first, the reception from the audience was great, and I soon relaxed and enjoyed the performance immensely. As the Los Angeles Times reported, Making his first concert appearance for nearly five years, the English singer-turned-actor seemed genuinely overwhelmed by the wild response of young fans who had sat patiently through the three preceding acts on the bill. It was a good review, and combined with the performance filled me with optimism for the new year and new album. That Christmas helped too, and was one that I wouldn't forget. On the invitation of Sherry, the gorgeous masseurs I'd gotten to know well, 
I found myself spending Christmas Day at Jack Nicholson's house. Sherry was a good friend of his daughter. When I arrived, I was led into the vast living room where the immaculately dressed actor stood in a green shirt and tie and dark trousers. The picture of a perfect host, he leaned across a small coffee table in front of a Picasso hanging over his fireplace, arched those eyebrows, shook my hand and said, Hi Adam, I'm Jack. I smiled and felt better than I had since arriving in LA and walking on the set at Universal for the first time. I'd seen him in A Few Good Men only a couple of weeks earlier, and of course I couldn't help but gush about how great I thought he was in it. Jack took all the praise graciously. He was a great host, attentive and always seemed to be flashing that smile. In January 1993, life took another good turn when I had a first date with a young actress who had joined my acting class with Harry Mastro George a few weeks earlier. I had been almost mesmerised by her from the moment she had walked in. Her name was Heather Graham and she was about to change my life in so many ways. With her pure, blue eyes and soft, gentle smile, Heather seemed like an angel to me. She was beautiful and clearly unaffected by the effect she had on men, which I loved. We spent our first date at the Tamashanta restaurant before returning to her apartment and spending the night listening to classical music station and talking all night. For the next three weeks we met for lunches, walks and dinner, always having fun and apparently liking each other. Yet I dare not make a move on her because it somehow didn't seem right. We were pals, it seemed. All the while I kept writing in my diary that she was almost too beautiful. Finally she made the first move, and I was gone. On January the 25th, 1993, I wrote in my diary, A wave of joy comes over me in the shape of Heather. I felt pure joy whenever we were together and spent most of my time thinking about her when we were apart. By the beginning of February, I was sure that this was serious stuff and that it didn't create the usual raging fear in my guts, accompanied by the desire to run a two-minute mile. That Heather felt the same kept me as happy as I had been for a very long time. While we were getting to know each other, and spurred on by a positive response to the acoustic gig Marco and I had played, I began to plan a tour of America at small clubs with a band led by Marco. While excited at the idea of playing music live again, I was also feeling that I didn't want to be away from Heather for too long. There was also the fact that I was paying for the tour too, because there was no record company to underwrite it. Still, I felt that it was an important step forward for me to get the musical career back on track. I was also determined that this time the tour would be fun, and without having to worry about how any record release was doing, I didn't have any extra pressure on me. After only eight days rehearsal with the band we opened in Orange County, California. We played eight shows back to back, including three sellouts at the Henry Fonda Theatre in LA, and then started to trek around America beginning in Palm Springs. In mid-March we were snowed in, in Atlanta, Georgia and I spent most of the time writing in my diary about my love for Heather, and I was using the word love without fear. The tour lasted five weeks, during which time I thought constantly of Heather, and wrote two or three letters a day to her during the dull travelling bits in between gigs. When I returned to LA and Heather, I felt fit and strong physically, and was determined to kick ass on the music front, which meant getting a new record deal signed. With the help of Miles Copeland, EMI had been approached and seemed like they were about to offer me a contract. However, after four weeks in LA during which time I discovered that I could do nothing to hurry them along, I found myself gardening a lot and becoming lethargic, which was not good. Laziness was always a sin to me. I hated it, not least because it often signalled a return of my depression. In May I took Heather to London for a two-week visit. Amazingly, we spent every day together in my small Primrose Hill flat, and I loved each minute of it. I didn't feel trapped or crowded at all. We visited my family, although not Les, friends and all of my favourite places, Chiswick House, Cookham and Greenwich among them. I also managed to meet with Clive Black, then head of EMI, and agreed that my next album should be all new material and not the songs that I had previously recorded with Bernard Edwards. So I started to write with Marco and work with a new drummer, John Reynolds, and Boz Bora, a fantastic rockabilly guitarist and co-writer with Morrissey, of a lot of great songs. After Heather returned to LA, I spent three weeks working with them, and also squeezed in a trip to Seaford to spend some time with Jordan and her kittens, 
which always made me calm and happy. However, when I wasn't working on music in London, I began to feel tired, remote, and as if things were moving in slow motion. I put it down to missing Heather, but couldn't stop the mounting irrational fear that I was having in the mornings. All that I could think about was getting away, running into the arms of Heather for love and comfort. So I did. I flew to Montreal where she was in the middle of making Mrs. Parker and the Vicious Circle. In order to be there, I had turned down a part in a movie that was to be shot at the same time in LA, but I genuinely felt that being with Heather was the right thing to do at the time, and for the first few days it was. There was a break in shooting and so we made love and laughed and spent every possible minute together. However, after Heather resumed filming I had nothing to do but think about my problems. It didn't take long before I felt as if I shouldn't be there. I felt like a spare part in her life which worried me. Heather was the subject of and the reason for all of the songs that I'd written with Marco and Boz in the previous three weeks. I had never felt this way about anyone before. I was determined to stay on set with her for as long as I could, which turned out to be five days. I then flew back to London to finish the songs and settle the EMI deal. Back in Primrose Hill though, jet lag hit and I found myself unable to get out of bed through sheer bloody fear for the next couple of days. After a huge effort on the third day, I finally pushed myself into work, but then I was too afraid to go to bed at night, simply because of the fear I knew that I'd feel when waking up the next day. During my time in London I would force myself to get out of bed as soon as I awoke, usually at 6.30am, and then get on with doing things, anything, and then the things to do ran out. With the EMI bosses on holiday and no more songs coming together, I planned to be back in LA when Heather got there, to be with her. I was putting Heather in the way of my fear and loathing, using her as a shield against my illness. She didn't know it of course, and I couldn't exactly put it into those words, but that was what I was doing. I even began to write in my diary that I could get engaged to Heather, that we could live together, get married even. She was 24 years old and just starting to make a career for herself. I was 38 and trying to restart mine, but willing and wanting to give her as much help and support as I could. Yet still, back in LA in mid-July, after a few short days, I was laying awake in my bed, alone, at 6.30am, with cold sweats and the shakes. Heather called me regularly from LA during the first few weeks of my recovery. We talk awkwardly and I could never bring myself to tell her that I didn't want to go back to LA. I couldn't tell her that the house we had shared I privately referred to as Amityville and couldn't separate it from my last trip and descent into hell. She sounded as if everything was normal and happy in her life, which relieved me. After a couple of weeks, she then began to try and make plans for us to meet, possibly in New York, in September. I stalled, trying to think of a reason not to go. It almost freaked me out to realise that we had to go our separate ways, but I knew that we had to. I had to occupy my time and my mind, so I went back to working on the release of a new album and planning a tour to promote it. Marco and I attempted to write new songs and things began to get back to a kind of normality. I was being kept stable by taking medication, which I was prescribed by a private doctor. In September I began psychiatric therapy twice a week with a female therapist who I liked enormously. She told me to think of what I had been through, not as a breakdown but as a breakthrough which I was very happy to do. She also told me that I had spent too much of my life looking after other people and not enough time looking after myself, which I now had to do. I agreed with her then, but looking back I realised that I didn't do enough of the looking after myself. It all helped me to feel stronger then though, and I was able to get on with my work, the music. Calls still came regularly from Heather through the autumn, and she was now saying that I seemed to be stronger and well when I wasn't with her and ill when I was, which I knew was true although I said nothing. Getting myself back into shape I made my usual lists of things to do, but added a list of things not to do as well. On one of them, a list headed, no more, was the line, listening to any more film offers. I also decided to drop out of Harry's acting classes, despite loving them and thinking of him as a kind of surrogate father. Many of his directions and maxims would come to me at different times in different situations throughout my life and I will always be grateful to him for teaching me so much, and not just about acting. 
I was determined to cancel my life in Los Angeles. It scared me to think about going back there. After meeting Carol Kaplan for lunch in mid-September of 1994, I found myself at the clinic of a friend of hers named Jack Temple. He looked like a classic nutty professor and waved a small bottle of fluid on a chain over everything that he treated. He said I had vodka poisoning in my legs and that my brain was only working at 1% of its capacity. He made me sit in a field in a circle of stones on a chair as he aimed a force stone at me. Ten minutes later I went back into his clinic and discovered that I had 20% of my brain working. In my vulnerable state I was ready to believe anything that could help me. I made several visits to Jack over the next few weeks, at times sitting in the pouring rain while he pointed his stone at me and restored my brain capacity for me. I wanted to believe him, and the fact that I hadn't touched vodka didn't enter my thoughts when he mentioned the poisoning in my legs. Each visit cost me money of course, but I considered it as well spent as the fees for my private doctor. Something seemed to be helping me and I began to feel kind of normal again. At the end of September I asked the doctor to reduce my medication and I managed to perform three songs at the EMI sales conference in Brighton without any extra stress. While there I met a new woman named Amy. I was sleeping better and started going out to clubs again, places like Soho House and the Groucho, private members clubs rather than nightclubs. Heather and I still talked on the telephone but neither of us were willing or able to end the affair and we both kept on pretending that I was going to go back to her in LA at some point. I listened to the remixes of the wonderful single and even began working on new songs with Marco. I got Nan's house in Cookham sold and then packed my bags and flew to New York to film Drop Dead Rock with Debbie Harry. While there I called Heather and told her that it was over between us and that I wouldn't be returning to Los Angeles. She was very polite and businesslike about it. She agreed to stay in the house until the lease ran out and to help me get my stuff sold or shipped back to London. We both knew that it was the right thing to do and I'm sure she felt as relieved as I was. I spent December 1994 in London and filmed a video for Wonderful with me truly crying my eyes out as the camera turned. I was thinking of all the sad times in my life, from my childhood to that day, and the tears fell easily. I also finished preparing for the single release of Wonderful in late January and agreed to play two songs with Nine Inch Nails at the Nassau Coliseum in New York. And so 1995 kicked off with Marco and I enjoying the applause from more than 20,000 people as we played physical and beat my guest with Trent Reznor and his Nine Inch Nails. God it felt good to be playing live again. Back in England two days later though things began to unravel. At a meeting to discuss promotion of the album, Miles Copeland told me in no uncertain terms that this album is your last chance and that I had to do things his way. I was stunned and fought back the best way I knew how and we parted ways. Marco and I rehearsed with the band for the tour that would begin in late March and by early February I was feeling tired and scared of breaking down, mostly because I feared that EMI would pull the album release with me unable to promote it. I had stopped taking my medication and was relying on the homeopathic powders from my doctor and twice weekly therapy sessions to keep me healthy. There was a lot more pressure on me to come too. At a gig in Dublin I wrenched my knee ligaments and had a quick operation in London in late March to fix the problem. I was feeling knackered but not sleeping too well. Inevitably one morning I woke up at my Primrose Hill flat with Amy, the girl from Brighton who I'd been seeing a lot of since Christmas, shaking. She held me tight in the way that I had so wanted Heather to eight months earlier. When the fear didn't fade after three days I took a limo to Seaford to stay at Jordan's house. For the next three days I drank tea, downed homeopathic powders and managed to get myself into a fit state to fly to America and begin the US tour. I even began to take my medication again, although in low dosage. For the first three weeks I felt just about well enough to perform, and that was it. After a show I'd be so tired that all I could do was shower on the bus and then fall asleep. By the last week of April however I couldn't even manage the shower. I'd collapse on my bunk and sleep in my stage clothes. In New Orleans I had chest pains and Marco had me rushed to hospital where they put a tube down my throat and ran some tests, all of which were negative thankfully. Then Marco began to feel as lethargic and ill as I did. Finally, after five weeks of me barely able to even sing let alone perform, 
We hit New York and both Marco and I had a series of tests run at her hospital. We were both diagnosed with glandular fever and quarantined there for two weeks. We finally got back to London in mid-June. I decided that the cause of my breakdown on the US tour had been my going cold turkey after stopping my medication and so began taking it again. By regulating different medications I was able to stabilise my sleeping routine. As 1995 came to an end, I felt stronger and more optimistic about the future than I had for years. I spent a relaxed and lovely Christmas 1995 with Jordan, her kittens and sister Sally in Seaford before returning to Primrose Hill for the end of the year. In January 1996 I took a walk around Spitalfields in East London. Having decided that I had to leave Primrose Hill and all of the terrible memories that my flat held, I was house hunting. The area I discovered held a treasure of old houses and interesting people that suited me more than Primrose Hill now seemed to. In the twenty years that I'd lived there, the hill had become a kind of New Hampstead. Where once there had been colourful characters there were now bankers and celebrities. The place no longer felt like a village, more of a catwalk at times. I went as far as to make an offer on a Spitalfields house. I would move in, I told myself, and find a wife and mother for the child I so desperately wanted. I was forty-one and getting broody. It was an unrealised ambition though, and a busy work schedule meant that I could never get the Primrose Hill flat sorted enough to put it on the market. And although my offer had been accepted, the Georgian house that I dreamed about moving into in Spitalfields was bought by somebody else. In late October of 1996, after months of hard work promoting Wonderful, I suffered my first truly bad episode of hypermania and couldn't sleep at all. Despite taking medication, I couldn't think straight and was terrified that I'd be arrested, that I'd go broke and that I'd lose everything. After four days without sleep, at dinner with my mum in her flat I collapsed completely. I raved at her and Tony between bouts of crying. Put on another course of medication by my doctor, it took until early 1997 for me to feel stable. Then, in March, Les died. He suffered a heart attack which killed him instantly. I felt glad that he didn't suffer and that he was finally at peace, but deeply saddened by his passing. He was my father and despite it all I had loved him. It didn't take long before thoughts about the terrible loneliness and sadness that Les must have suffered in his final days, spent alone in a dingy council flat began to haunt me, even before I found myself standing over his cremated remains. In an attempt to get away from London and my grief over Les, I accepted an invitation from Vivian Westwood to attend her show at Paris Fashion Week. It was to prove one of the most fateful trips I ever made. In the crush at the door to get into the Westwood show, with overzealous bouncers denying anyone access, I was about to give up and go for a walk when Lorraine Gibson, one of Vivian's PR girls, grabbed my arm and pulled me into the hall. She smiled at me as I took in her long, long legs and beautiful 1940s style glamour girl outfit. Later that night we walked through the wet streets of Paris to the Eiffel Tower and talked and talked. After we got back from Paris Lorraine and I spent every day together. I asked her to come with me to America. She said yes and we flew to New York where we hired a car. We drove south until hitting Dayton, Tennessee and both fell in love with a house perched on top of a mountain that had a for sale sign out front. It was a timber, A-framed place with views far out over the Tennessee Valley and a bit of land around it. After staying a few weeks in a motel in Dayton, I bought the house. Lorraine and I were married in the courthouse in the small town a couple of weeks later. After a couple of months of marital bliss, Lorraine announced that she was pregnant and I was overjoyed. As was becoming the pattern in my life though, that joy didn't last, and in October 1997 we were back in Primrose Hill, with me suffering terrible depressions, unable to speak or function. However, when my daughter Lily was born in the spring of 1998, I was there to see her emerge and I was the first person to hold her. I'll never forget the fantastic feeling I had when she looked into my eyes for the first time. I felt that I had become a man at last. From that moment Lily became my reason to live and the one true love in my life. Back at home I'd feed and change Lily, take her for walks and sit just staring at her while she slept. And then I began to feel the depression returning. My relationship with Lorraine had become difficult. The pressure of living in my one bedroom flat didn't help things for either of us. Lorraine made the decision to move out with Lily 
I was distraught. I went into the Chelsea Westminster Hospital and for weeks I couldn't move or barely think. Eventually though, realising that I'd never get to see my daughter regularly if I was in such a state, I knew that I had to get myself back into shape, and so I did. With a new drug regime in place and regular sessions of therapy, I grew well enough that Lily could visit me at home in Primrose Hill. For a while Lily's visits took place with her mother present, and then it became just me and my girl, and those were the happiest days of my life. I'd buy paper, pens, glue and stuff that we could make into houses, spaceships and dinosaurs. we spend hours sticking, colouring and laughing at what we'd made on those days. If only they could go on forever, I'd tell myself, then everything would be okay. Of course, every day wasn't like that. Not at all. I spent much of the time between 1999 and 2001 shifting between hypermania and deep depression. When manic I'd believe that I could conquer the world. I'd take off for anywhere not knowing where I was going or why. One time I found myself in a car bound for Scotland with three men and a woman I hardly knew. Apparently I was helping her to take her things back home to Edinburgh from London. I had hired a car and asked one guy to drive and two others had come along for the ride. At a service station somewhere on the M1 I spent over £200 on chocolate and CDs before suddenly becoming aware of where I was and not knowing why. I got scared and became abusive. The woman called the police. When two female police officers arrived to find me sitting on the curb and this woman too scared to get in the car, they simply asked me for an autograph and left, telling us all to stop being so silly. We all returned to London that night. On my 47th birthday I began to drink alcohol for the first time since 1978. When at a birthday party in Soho, some friends, who didn't really know me, gave me vodka laced with God knows what, and I swallowed it all. In my hypermanic state, alcohol had little effect on me. After a while, even when calm, I began to drink lager at home. In the years between 1999 and 2002, I managed to frighten and upset many good friends, such as Jordan, Danny Kleinman, Dave Pash and Marco. I'd insult them, swear at them, call them at all hours of the day and night and accuse them of all sorts of mad things. I scared my mum and upset Tony, no end. I can never apologise enough to all of them for my behaviour during that time. I was deliberately not taking the medication. I didn't tell anyone of course but I was stashing pills in a box in my bathroom and believed that I functioned better without them. It was always going to lead to big trouble and finally in January 2002 it led me to do the most stupid thing I have ever done. Throw the gun out of the car. What? Where did all these police cars come from? Oi, where are you going? The driver of the minicab I was sitting in had almost jumped out of his seat and run like a bat out of hell across the road. There's a police patrol car parked diagonally across the road and two or three others just to the right of me. There are policemen with bulletproof vests on pointing their guns at the car I'm sitting in. One is shouting at me. Throw the gun out of the car and then get out of the car with your hands up. Fuck, they're talking to me. Throw the gun out of the car now. Shit, what gun? This one on the seat? Alright, I'm throwing it out. Now get out of the car with your hands up and kneel down on the ground. Where am I? What's going on? Why? Get out of the car now. Alright, alright, I'm getting out. Don't shoot. Put your hands on your head, together. I do it and immediately feel a size 10 boot in the back and a pair of hands gripping my hands from behind. My face hits the wet tarmac of the Camden Street and a knee thumps into my neck. Another size 10 boot kicks my legs apart and another knee lands in the small of my back. Fuck that hurt. Alright mate we're picking you up now, don't struggle. My arms are grabbed on both sides under the armpit and I'm wrenched to my feet. Two big cops half drag me to a patrol car and force me into the back seat. I have no idea of why I'm here, how the gun got into that minicab, nor what has just happened. And now I'm scared. At around midday on the 12th of January 2002, in a fit of hypermania, I walked from Camden Market to the Prince of Wales pub in Prince of Wales Road. It didn't take too long, certainly not long enough for my irrational anger to wear off. The day before I'd been to see a woman who ran a stall in the market selling clothes, who I'd asked to make me a couple of things and given her my telephone number so that she could call me. 
That night her husband had found the piece of paper with my name and number and didn't like it. He called my home about twenty times through the night accusing me of having an affair with his wife, but far worse was when he made threats towards Lily. So there I was, with someone having told me that he'd be in the Prince of Wales. Having walked there dressed in a combat jacket, leather trousers and wearing a white cowboy hat and blue tinted glasses. As I walked into the bare, beer-stained pub, the handful of regulars sitting at the bar turned and looked at me. One of them laughed and another began to whistle the theme music from the good, the bad and the ugly. I asked where the husband was and got a bunch of stupid answers. He wasn't there and I had to leave because it was a private member's bar, not a pub. Royally fucked off I left, shouting over my shoulder that I'd be back. The rest of the day is lost to me. I have no idea of where I went or what I did. Somehow I got hold of my father's starting pistol and walked back to the Prince of Wales. That part of Camden and Kentish town is an odd area. There were then run down, crack filled council estates that sit behind streets of small expensive houses. There's also a bunch of cheap car repair shops. Somewhere on my walk to the Prince of Wales I picked up a car starter motor. When I got to the pub, I took aim and threw the starter motor through the plate glass window. Some of the blokes I'd seen earlier came running out into the street shouting that they'd fucking murder me. I ran and they chased me. In an alleyway on the council estate I found myself cornered by a bunch of them, so I pulled the gun out of my jacket. They stopped and ran back into the pub. I stood there in a kind of daze holding the gun. I felt like I was in a film but had no script. After a while I wandered back into the road still with a gun in my hand. Apparently a policeman spotted me and radioed for help. I didn't know that of course and went in search of a minicab with the intention of heading off into Soho. I was officially arrested but at some point someone in the police station realised that I was ill and I was taken to the Royal Free Hospital. Once there I told them about my psychiatrist at the Chelsea and Westminster and calls were made. Within a few hours I was home. There was a small welcoming committee of close friends plus my mum close to tears and scared for me. They had arranged, they said, for me to go to the Chelsea and Westminster voluntarily until I got better. I wasn't having that and told them so, which was when they told me that if necessary they would have me sectioned. Scared I ran out of my flat and along the canal path to Camden. God knows how long I was there, but I was picked up by the police again and taken directly to the Royal Free. Once there I was put into a secure ward named Alice. I was furious and managed to get to a payphone, from where I called two tabloid newspapers. I ranted to them about being wrongfully imprisoned in what I called the Alice in Wonderland ward of the Royal Free. I kept repeating that I was innocent, that I had been abducted by the police and that it was all a conspiracy against me. The papers naturally had a field day. I was detained in the Alice ward for a couple of weeks and then moved to a private clinic for a further couple of weeks. Despite being back at home in the months leading up to my court case, I began to fret over what might happen to me. This went straight to the heart of one of my greatest fears, being locked up. My first visit to the Old Bailey in 2002 was terrifying. There are bars on the windows, and bullet and bomb-proof doors divide the hallways that had reverberated with the footsteps of some of the country's most notorious criminals. At the first hearing my lawyer attempted to have my various charges dismissed on the grounds of temporary insanity. I had been charged with some serious crimes. Causing a fray, using threatening behaviour, criminal damage, possession of a firearm and assault occasioning actual bodily harm. My psychiatrist told the court that public revelation of too many of the facts of the hearing could result in another hypermanic episode for me, as well as depression and even attempted suicide. The court issued an order limiting the press coverage. The judge didn't agree with my lawyer's argument though, and when it finally came to it I pleaded guilty to a fray, with other charges being dropped. I was placed on probation for six months. In the period between hearings I took my medicine, and because of it gained weight. As the final court appearance approached I knew that there would be photographers waiting and I worried increasingly about facing them. I decided that I'd grow a beard believing that no one would recognise me with it, which is why, dressed in my most sensible clothes, wearing a flat cap and my earnest Hemingway beard, I entered the Old Bailey through the front door. Unfortunately, of course, I was recognised, and the subsequent headlines depressed me. At least it made me lose the beard and I worked on my weight. 
My good behaviour lasted for nine months or so. Then on the 11th of June 2003, I attempted to force my way into the flat of my downstairs neighbour by smashing his patio door in with a shovel. Having heard me at his back door, naturally he ran out the front of the building, in his underwear, and stopped a passing police car. I followed him out but went to a cafe round the corner. Once inside I decided that I wanted to go to sleep and so, naturally took off my trousers. The police found me curled up on the concrete floor in the basement of the cafe. They led me back upstairs and covered my Union Jack boxer shorts with a blanket before leading me out to the car while a small crowd watched. Once again I was charged with a fray. I was taken to a psychiatric ward in what had been a hospital for tropical diseases in King's Cross. A dark and dour Victorian building, the strip lights never went out and the beds were steel and couldn't be moved. It was a truly terrifying place with its battered furniture and broken TV. In September at Highbury Corner Magistrates Court, my lawyer entered a plea of not guilty in my absence and the case was adjourned until psychiatric reports could be made. I was then sectioned under the Mental Health Act. The only thing that really helped me and kept me going during this dreadful time was a new relationship with a truly wonderful woman. I had been lucky enough to get to know Claire, a designer, a few months before my first public disgrace. Amazingly, as the newspapers and media heaped ridicule on me in 2002, Claire and I grew closer and she supported me and helped me through that period. I had fallen in love with her. I spent six months in hospital. At various times, so Claire told me, I could see birds flying. At others I'd see my daughter Lily running across the room playing hide and seek under the table. Of course they were hallucinations. Gradually as time passed though I came out of the deepest part of the depression. I underwent therapy which basically involved the recollection of my thoughts, the balance of medication and my recovery progress. After three months, the doctors allowed me one hour a day out of hospital under Claire's supervision. Eventually, I was allowed a whole day out. On those days, we would go for walks and I could feel the fresh air on my face. We went to a coffee shop on an early outing and I remember distinctly the smell of my first cappuccino. It tasted like a sweet memory. The days that I got to spend out of the hospital helped me realise how fragile I still was. But I began to realise how much I wanted my life back. With Claire's patience and support I was eventually granted weekend visits home. In February 2004 I was released from hospital. With the unconditional love of Lily and love and support from Claire, with a few good friends by my side, I have been able to look forward and find a clarity in dealing with the events that have taken place in my life and understand how to manage my illness. I am in recovery. As I finished writing my life story, Claire asked me what the difference is now, compared to all the other times in my life when I've been in control and in love. What's to say that I won't have another relapse, she asked. Is there a happy ending to this? What's different? I thought for a while before realising that the difference is her. For the first time in my life I am in a relationship with someone where everything is equal. I don't feel that I have to look after her or hide anything from her. How could I? Claire has seen me at the lowest I've ever been, yet she is still here, by my side. Ever since I had to go to the orphanage at the age of seven, I have felt that I had to look out for those closest to me as well as myself. Part of what drove me on to fame and success was the need to be able to look after my mum, my family and my friends. Thirty years after waking up in the emergency ward of a mental hospital as adamant, it feels as if life is only really just beginning. This time though, I've been awakened by a kiss and not a slap on the face. It's a kind of fairy tale ending. I fully intend to live happily ever after.